Welcome to this DMM community session. We're very lucky today that we have uh, Dr. Kenichi Mikami, who is a psychotherapist working in Japan. So Ken has a really interesting relationship with the DMM, and we're going to explore that today, as well as see some of his clinical work, which he's going to present to us as well. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce him. So hi, Ken. Good to have you with us. Uh, thank you for give me, giving me a, such a great chance to talk with you and with other DMMRs. That is absolutely okay. Well, I know there is a lot of interest in the DMM from a sort of transcultural perspective. And so speaking to you today gives a really, gives a real insight into that. So thank you for being here. So I'd like to begin by asking you a little bit about your background for the DMM. So if you tell us perhaps a little bit about um, what you do professionally and, and how you got there. Okay, um, now I'm working in the university as a university counselor uh, about 16 years now. And uh, before that, I had um, many clinical experiences like working in a, uh, um, hospital or um, working with clients with alcohol and drunk, drug dependent. Mm -hmm. And um, I started training at the postgraduate school in Japan uh, from 97. Mm -hmm. And um, since that time, I have been interested in applying attachment theory to clinical practice. But actually, at that time in Japan, attachment theory is just regarded as for uh, empirical research, not for clinical practice. Okay, so I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna pause you there then. So yeah. at that point in, in 97, you stepped into postgrad postgrad training. How had you always wanted to be a therapist or a psychologist? Had that been a path where you'd been on for a long time? Um, from undergraduates, mm -hmm. I have measured in psychology. You know, when actually when I was in high school, I was thinking of going to study a uh, kind of science like physics or chemistry, but I found that's not very interesting for me. And, um, you know, at that time, I was quite um, obsessed with music, playing okay. fruit, wow. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering if there is a kind of, you know, um, I want to do something scientific, but uh -huh. also I want to do something, you know, humanistic or something like that. And I, I thought, I just thought psychology may be the between humanity, humanities wow. and science. And so that's that, that... why I chose the psychology uh -huh. as an undergraduate. That's an amazing um, way of seeing it. And, and even looking back now, do you see psychology as, the, as almost the intersection between science and music and science and art? Yeah. And exactly. is that something that's consistent in how you work? Yes. Fantastic. And I suppose I don't want to jump ahead too much, but would you say that the attachment work that you do, do you find that has an artistic quality alongside the empirical? And um, so I thought attachment can bridge the gap mm -hmm. between clinical practice and uh, empirical research. Mm -hmm. But at that time, at least in Japan, few people are interested in this problem. Uh -huh. So I was struggling to study Atta about attachment by myself. And uh, after I finished 
master course in Japan, I decide to go to UK、mm-hmm. just because UK is a country where John Bowlby was born. <laughs> and was that your main attraction because of Bowlby, because of your interest and attachment? Yes. And、uh, because um, um, it was just six months, but、uh, during my、um, third year in undergraduate course, I had a chance to go to Australia as、uh-huh. an exchange student. And I thought it's very important to go out of Japan and to experience cultural difference rather than just reading a lot of books. Okay, so I'm going to pause you、yeah. there then before that. So I'm interested in that idea of looking for cultural difference. Outside of Japan. So, on attachment,、uh, when you said it wasn't really、uh, applied clinically, so are we talking here about Balby? We're talking about Ainsworth. It was, was Crittenden's work part of your early training in Japan?、Uh, not at all.、Mm-hmm. But I happen to read the, the early paper. Which was internal representation of models of attachment relationships. It's published in 1990 in、uh-huh. Infant Mental Health Journals. And actually, I was quite、um, impressed with this article. But、uh-huh. after that, I didn't have much, I have almost have no chance to read her article.、Uh-huh. And- So, had, was that the, the paper that attracted you to attachment, or was that in the midst of your interest in attachment and then you found that paper? I think、uh, because this paper, you know, t r y to integrate different schools of psychotherapies、mm-hmm. in terms of representational models and、uh, memory systems. Uh-huh. Which I quoted later in my presentation. Yeah. And、uh, I was, you know, I found it interesting that the, the different ideas of the various psychotherapy schools can be explained in terms of memory systems and representation models.、Uh, I was. Even at that time, I was a bit fed up with the、uh, kind of my school is the best or something like that. You know?、Uh-huh. So, yeah, that's why probably I was attracted by her paper. Okay. And so, in terms of、um, your sort of、uh, theoretical and philosophical background as a, a therapist, what was that? What were the, the schools of thought that you were being trained、um, in? Basically, I have been trained. As an in a psychoanalytic tradition,、mm-hmm. especially in my postgraduate school,、uh, the, the ego psychology、mm-hmm. was quite、uh, popular at that time. And、uh, because、um, there was one famous clinical psychologist who was specialized in Rorschach test,、yes. she、mm-hmm. used Ego psychology as a framework to interpret the result of Rorschach test.、Uh-huh. So I studied a lot of Rorschach test and then the theory of psychoanalysis. Okay, that's fascinating. It's interesting you man- mentioned the Rorschach. We,、um, just as an aside, our next talk is with、uh, Peter Norbeck.、Yeah. He's published papers on the Rorschach、yes. and adult attachment interviews. That's an interesting. Yeah, I read、thing. his articles. At- Uh, and I find it quite interesting. Oh, great. Well, you'll have to come to his talk then as well.、Uh, yeah,、um, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there was a sort of psychoanalytic background for you, but you say that perhaps you felt that the different models were trying to compete and claim sort of hierarchy, but it seemed like attachment offered something different, clinically at least.、Um, and in Japan, and particularly at that time, Um, how aligned was Japanese 
um, the, 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 the work as a therapist to perhaps what we might see in the UK? Was it, what were the, what were the fashions and trends at that time? Was, was psychoanalysis the predominant model that was applied? Yes, I think at the time psychoanalysis and also Jungian psychotherapy, mm -hmm. because one famous uh, clinician, uh, Hayao Kawaii, mm -hmm. he was a quite powerful person to, he was a leading person in clinical psychology and psychotherapy in Japan. So Freudian, uh, Jungian therapy was quite dominant at that time. Mm -hmm. But around after 2000, cognitive behavior therapy becomes more dominant, I think, in Japan. Okay, so it's a similar perhaps um, patterns to we see here in, in the UK and the West more broadly. Um, okay, so you, you were telling me about your journeys overseas and you'd come to the UK you, because of Balby, um, but also Australia too. So if you can tell me a little bit more about that and perhaps how you then started to build your relationship with the DMM. Okay. Um, you know, when I was in Australia, I went to ask a lecturer who taught clinical psychology uh, about his opinion about psychoanalysis, because as I said, the psychoanalysis was quite popular in Japan. And he said, no, psychoanalysis doesn't have any evidence. So CBT is better or something like that. Okay. And I thought, oh, maybe I should study CBT. But uh, nevertheless, the reason I uh, decided to go to my postgraduate school to study psychoanalytic perspective is I was uh, quite interested in human development. Uh -huh. And I didn't know whether CBT deal with the uh, human development theoretically, mm -hmm. at least at the time. So I thought psychoanalytic approach would be uh, more interesting, at least to me. And uh, I joined the kind of research project uh, about affect attunement. Uh, it's um, the project to observe the interaction between mother and infant, because one of my supervisor uh, did her PhD about the Daniel Stan's affect attunement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite interesting. And uh, because of that, I was quite interested in observing the interaction and how I was wondering how the representations of the mother can affect their interaction with the baby. Uh -huh. And uh, also I had a chance to trans, uh, join the translation of the Daniel Stan's motherhood constellation into okay. Japanese. And that, that was um, uh, just as same as Pat's uh, paper, uh -huh. they uh, try to integrate, it, integrate different schools of psychotherapies in terms of representation. And uh, also, I was introduced the uh, self psychologies book about uh, intersubjective approach uh -huh. by uh, Stororo and others. And uh, I was fascinated by the idea that is uh, clinical phenomena is co-constructed by the both by both the therapist subjectivity and the client's subjectivity. Mm -hmm. now, I thought that I can integrate the mother infant research into the client therapist interaction. Mm -hmm. That's what I vaguely thought of at that time. <laughs> but it's just an idea because, then, mm -hmm. as I said, I was trained in, trained in ego psychology tradition. Ego psychology is, uh, in a sense, typical one person psychology, like yes. ego, ego is dealing with their sexual drive or something. Uh -huh. But I don't know how to 
uh, integrate the idea of in ego psychology with the attachment theory, uh -huh. like uh, in a relational developmental context. I was confused by that. So that's a point I thought maybe I should go to UK. I can find something. And then I wrote a lot of email to the universities in UK and the uh, University of Kent. It was called the University of Kent at, Can at Canterbury at that time. Uh -huh. uh, had a um, good response. And uh, eventually I entered the postgraduate diploma course. Okay. And uh, I stayed there two years. Uh -huh. And uh, it was not like uh, I had a special training of attachment in that course, but I I had that I had a chance to study more deeply about psychoanalysis. Uh -huh. And uh, especially, you know, it was a famous textbook of uh, the Greenberg and Mitchell's uh for the name but the but they discussed discussed about the kind of relational term in psychoanalysis from drive structure model to relational structure model mm -hmm. and uh, i think that that gave me a kind of meta theoretical perspective into many types of psych psychoanalytic theories uh -huh. And I thought, oh, maybe uh, it was uh, the, I had a difficulty in applying attachment theory to practice, clinical practice, because eco psychology is a kind of one person psychology. So it's uh -huh. quite contradictory with um, attachment, the framework of attachment theory. But if I study more about the relational psychoanalysis, maybe I can integrate them more effectively that's what i thought okay it's quite so a theoretical it's... question but <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like a really interesting journey both i suppose literally and fig figuratively that that it seems like you've had this tension that you felt that ev that psychotherapy is relational that that you know the human condition is a interpersonal one and yet the work that you've been trained in really places it in just that individual and you've sort of crossed the globe almost in pursuit of the relationship and so it sounds like that was starting to to develop in in Kent and I suppose from there how did you come into contact with the DMM and did the DMM sort of fit into what you were looking for at that point? Yes um Actually, I had to wait for a long time to meet the DMM. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I, during my stay in UK, I had a chance to know the psychotherapy research at my course. And that was very um, uh, kind of turning point for me because um, in Japan, uh, Usually or mostly psychoanalytic therapists are not interested in empirical research. Uh -huh. I found it quite surprising to know that the many UK analytic therapists are also interested in doing the empirical research in psychotherapy research. And uh, I thought, oh, this is useful to bridge the gap between uh -huh. empirical research and clinical uh practice and uh, also in the second year of my stay starting in uk um i had a chance to work in work uh to work as a counselor in the uh, institution for drug and alcohol addicts mm -hmm. and uh, it was just one year but i I, I, I saw many clients who try to um, like self-medicate her, his or her trauma. Mm -hmm. So in attachment relationships. So I thought the, the apparent problem 
problematic behavior like drug addict or alcohol problem or something like that should be need to be contextualized in their attachment relationships. Uh -huh. Th that's what I thought in my one year clinical practice. Uh -huh. And uh, I think I'm not very sure, probably it, it was the, in 2002, I happened to attend the PAT uh, one day workshop in London. But was this because it was something that you'd seen and been attracted to, or was it just by chance that you were able to uh, Yeah, attend? I think I just found it by chance. Okay. But because um, London is just one, one hour from uh, Canterbury, mm -hmm. so I attended it. And later when I asked Pat, she said that was the first time for her to... Uh, have a workshop in London. I'm not sure if it's true or not. But anyway, I I happened to see her and uh, I thought her lecture was quite exciting. Uh -huh. She talked about, you know, her DMM models and the cultural difference and showed us uh, some uh, infant care index videos. And then uh, yeah, it was exciting. And uh, I read, after that, I tried to find some articles, uh, her articles like uh, uh, attachment and psychopathology or something, and uh, uh -huh. I was impressed by that. But nevertheless, because um, she didn't write her own book at that time, after I went back to Japan, I forgot about her. Okay. But then I um, probably I when I went to join the, attend the conference by held by Bowlby Center in two thousand eight or nine. Uh -huh. I bought a book, uh, raising parents. Yes, and uh, I found it quite interesting. And uh, I was uh, shocked by the sentence uh, when I was reading it. Um, it's, she said, um, clinical opinion regarding attachment is concerning. For most of the experts rendering the opinion have no formal training in attachment. Uh, also, this is most you know, about mostly about using attachment for code. Uh -huh. But nevertheless, I thought, oh, this is about me. <laughs> I had already written some case articles, case reports based on attachment theory. Uh -huh. But I, I felt, you know, uh, you know, I felt not completely sure if my understanding or assessment is right. Uh -huh. And uh, I found this sentence. And oh, this is me. So <laughs> I have to go to study AI with her. So at so this point, why. you've obviously now been working for quite a long time. You're, I'm sure, very well informed as a psychologist. Mm -hmm. How did that feel? Uh, I think it's something that we, a lot of us have probably experienced when mm -hmm. coming across the DMM. But how did it feel to find something and, and hear those words, which are quite stark? Did you feel, well, tell me how you felt. Um, I was shocked, but it's it's a not very negative one actually. Uh -huh. I thought, oh, this is the right direction to go. I uh -huh. found, I finally found it. It was yeah. like that. And is that is that what it felt like then? Reading raising parents and and what um, Pat had said, because it does seem that you've been searching for some way of making sense of all of these different models and ways of working that fitted with what you seem to sense was the case? And did you feel that from that point, the DMM felt like it could answer some of those questions for you? Yeah, I think um, because uh, her book was quite persuasive and uh, I thought the problem of the ABC plus D was it's just too simple. Uh -huh. 
categories. It was, I thought it was not good enough to understand the uh, clients who had more complex organizations or strategies. So I think the content was fascinating mm -hmm. and the timing was the best. <laughs> so I also, I thought, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I might be loved by many people. It's a waste of time. You have to spend a lot of time and money. And uh, uh -huh. how, how many times can you use DMM AI in a busy clinical practice? But nevertheless, it's okay. I, I have to go and find, you know, experience by myself. Uh -huh. So that's why I decided to have a training. Fantastic. So you went and you trained with Dr. Christendon herself in the yeah. AAI. Okay, and that's fascinating. And we're going to talk much more about, I'm sure we'll touch more on, on your sort of experience of that later on. And but you're going to present some case studies yeah. for us. Um, um, we'll also have questions from, from our audience as well, and I'll be able to read those out if, okay. um, if people aren't available to. So I want to talk about the application of the DMM to clinical, clinical practice in Japan. Uh, firstly, please see the ranking of the problems in education. Um, in Japan and Korea, the problem of the education is too much pressure for entrance exam. And uh, while the US, the number one problem is a juvenile del delinquency. So Japan also, as well as Korea, is famous for, you know, uh, giving too much pressure on young people to study hard to go into the enter the good universities, and uh, I want to talk about the case Noriko. Noriko felt that she was rubbish. Who was who saw uh, who thought she was useless for her mother. She often watched her father became violent toward her mother. She tried to study hard to please her mother. Actually, she had been a good student until high school. However, after she was scolded by her teacher for some small mistakes, she stopped going to school, starting self-harm, and eventually hospitalized after overload. And... Uh, but she, she did enter the university, and at first she was doing well. However, she gradually became depressed because of her interpersonal problems, including her boyfriend. She seemed to become aggressive toward her boyfriend while seeming trying to be good client in front of me. Uh, actually, this is our first case. I applied the DMM to my clinical case. I didn't. Um, we don't do AI with her, but um, with uh, Dr. Critten's Den's consultation, her classification was speculated as U-trauma dismissing the uh, DV A3 and A4 minus for mother, and uh, she five and six for father and triangulated. I think this classification seems to explain the influence of her trauma while her different interpersonal behavior across the situation, that is toward me and toward her boyfriend was quite different. So I guess she uh, alternate, she was alternating her strategy during the therapy. Um, and the reason I introduced this case at first is, uh, you know, this classification, especially A for minus uh, comparative performance was quite fit well with uh, young Japanese people. When I had a chance to talk about the DMM, many clinicians are 
show interest in A for minus and uh, oh, I have a similar clients or, you know, this concept made them help them to understand why they behave like that. So I saw, I think comparative performance is uh, uh, quite, um, in a sense, popular uh, strategy because um, uh, in many cases, this strategy help young people to uh, adapt themselves to the schools because as long as they had a good, uh, they study well, they are uh, supported by parents and uh, teachers. But once they failed, like this case, for some reason, you know, they suddenly get depressed. That's what I often e experience in my clinical practice. And also, um, I want to talk about a bit about young people and suicide in Japan. The ranking of cause of death for young people from 15 to 34 years old. Uh, the, the number one of the cause of death is suicide in Japan. Except Korea, this is not seen in other uh, countries. So I think it's, it's quite interesting. Both Japan and Korea has a lot of pressure on studying and they have a, you know, higher suicide rate for young people. Uh, this is research. In university, some students come to have counseling, not for their own problems, but for their friends' problems, especially when they are suicidal. Usually, they are very nice. I mean, those friends are very nice and kind students who are trying to help their friends in crisis at first, but gradually feel distressed and helpless and often even get angry in the end. Lisa had a friend who was diagnosed as a bipolar disorder. She had a tendency, Lisa had a tendency to accept the role of caregiving with her friends at first, she tried to listen to her friend's story carefully, but after she became suicidal, she felt anxious and annoyed and then helpless. I listened to Lisa's feelings carefully, then gave her some advice um, to how to keep an appropriate distance with a friend. After a few months, when Lisa called her friend's mother, she was surprised to find that her friend is not suicidal anymore, became much more stable. I think um, the concepts of vicious circles and accomplices are quite useful to understand this case. Uh, Paul Wachter assumed that clients fall into vicious circles which perpetuate his or her dysfunctional patterns of thinking or behavior. Those who join the vicious circles are called accomplices. Wachter believed that our perception of others and behavior to them affects others' response to us, which often tend to confirm our original expectation of others. This pattern will be carried into other interactions with different people, which will confirm or reinforce their belief and perpetuate the same pattern. So at first, when unstable client, that is Lisa's friend, uh, you know, said, help me. Lisa is because as she, because she's caregiving person. Are you okay? Contact me anytime. She responded like that. So suppose uh, this friend is a C type person who exaggerating negative effect, often asking for help for, my, uh, for many things. And uh, suppose Lisa is an A type person 
especially a three person who try to uh, take care of others. At first, their relationship is going very well, but then the C type friends demand becomes more intense. Something like, if you don't come now, I will die. She sent a message at midnight, exagger exaggerating negative effect more intensely. So Lisa, that's enough, go away. So she eventually abandoning, trying to abandon her. So in the worst case, this kind of friend, she type person was confirmed or oh, attachment figure is no more available and she might have a suicidal behavior. So in this sense, there, the, what, what is happening here is a vicious circle. That is, um, she type person is not sure about the availability of the attachment figure. So she always feel uh, she might be abandoned. And, uh, but the more she exaggerating her negative effect, the more stressed the Lisa is. So Lisa is finally wanting to abandon her. So at that point, her attitude becomes inconsistent or unpredictable because at first she was quite caregiving and then she tried to abandon her. So eventually becoming a accomplice, that is um, the past attachment relationship, unpredictable mother and uh, uh, anxious child is enacted in this negative uh, vicious circle. So when a client shows suicidal behavior repeatedly in an involving way, I always try to find who are accomplices. Accomplices tend to behave, which confirms clients' dysfunctional strategies. All we need to do is not to change the clients themselves, but change their environment so that the client strategy work better. To put in uh, to put it in other words, clinicians need to cut the vicious circles happening between the client and his or her accomplices. And next, I want to talk about uh, otaku clients. Akio came to see me because he had difficulty in his interpersonal relationships, as well as deciding his career. He admitted himself as otaku, which is a Japanese word that describes people with consuming interests, particularly in anime, manga, video games, or computers. This is a typical image of otaku. And Akio told me that in his adolescence, he became otaku after he was re rejected by his female friend. Also, he was not sure if he should choose a career. His, he, if he should choose a career, his parents, which his parents expected, but he felt his parents wouldn't listen to him. Gradually, during the session, he started talking about uh, otaku topics such as anime or its voice actress. He kept talking and talking as if he didn't mind whether I listened to him or not. Gradually, I felt very drowsy during the session. Later, I started to understand this is an enactment of his past rejecting, rejected attachment relationship. After I picked up his anxiety of being rejected in here and now, he finally expressed his feelings toward me and I overcame my drowsiness. So in his past attachment relationship, I guess their attachment figure is rejecting. So mother rejected client in infancy. 
and she must have felt re feel feel feeling rejected. This rejecting, rejected relationship is encoded into procedural memory. And then in the therapeutic relationship, this time client rejects therapist, that's me in therapy, because then she didn't care about me, just continue talking about his uh, otaku topic. So he was rejecting and I felt rejected and it turned into drowsiness as a counter transference. So in a sense, rejecting rejected relationship is enacted in therapeutic relationship. I think this was what I experienced in my session. So I think um, here it's the same. I, I was involved in the enactment just as Lisa's friend, uh, Lisa was involved in the enactment of her friend. So I need to uh, cut their um, vicious circle uh, by talking about his anxiety of being rejected by me in the here and now relationships. So the next topic is karoshi. Uh, this is death caused by overwork or job-related exhaustion. In 2002, Oxford Dictionary on the web added this Japanese word, karoshi, as a new English word. So this suggested that there is no corresponding word or concept in English to describe this phenomenon. And therefore, karoshi might reflect a unique aspect of Japanese culture. Uh, this is the acquisition rate of paid holiday. You know, uh, when I was working in UK, I was surprised to find uh, all the staffs taking long holidays, which is quite rare in Japan. And uh, in Brazil and France, 100% and the, the acquisition rate was 100%. And in US, uh, it's not 71%. In Korea, it's 70%. And, uh, but in Japan, it's just 39%. So it's extremely lower rate. Just that means Japanese people just keep working and working without taking long holidays. So foreigners might think Japanese live and die for their work. That's Chicago Tribune. So the next case is Takako. Takako was also a single and female postgraduate student in her 30s. She came to see me because she wanted, to, she wanted to understand herself in order to change her workaholic lifestyle. She slept just three hours or something every day and just keep working without taking holidays. Her father was frequently violent toward her mother. Takako had often found her mother crying in the kitchen. Since her childhood, she was often told by many people that she was always smiling, which she wasn't aware of. Takako had two long-term relationships with her past boyfriends, which lasted about 10 years for each, but ended up breaking up eventually. After the session and the therapy started, she soon developed erotic transference toward me. Also, she was often worried about whether she was bothering me or not. At first, I tried to accept and empathize with her feelings. However, Gradually, I started feeling that occasional meetings were becoming a burden 
as though her self-fulfilling prophecy was becoming actualized in this therapeutic relationship. Also, I started feeling irritated when she showed her smile when she was talking about her problems. Because of my counter-transference, eventually I suggested termination of the therapy, which obviously was too early at that stage. Because she had felt scared by explore, exploring her past, she almost agreed with the termination, but also showed some anxiety. Thus, both of us, both of us tried to escape from the therapy, leading to collusively seeking for the termination of the therapy. So in the, at this point, the therapist responded as accomplice. However, because I finally realized that she felt anxiety and loneliness in the face of possible termination, I decided to use the DMM AI to overcome this rupture. So the result was uh, DOU trauma disorganized and many trauma and A4, C3, and uh, partial five and triangulation. So it's very complex uh, strategies. After the DMM AI, she realized that she was trying to terminate the therapy overly early in order to reduce the shock of separation from the therapist in the same way that she had done with her former boyfriend. Also, she stopped showing her usual smile uh, After the AI, for the first time, I felt I was able to feel her true feelings. Also, the AI helped me to reflect on my counter-transference and recover my empathic attitude toward her. After several years, she contacted me to let me know that she changed her place of work, that she was not as busy as before, and that she had finally married a new partner. I believe that using the DMM AI helped me to cut the vicious circle during the session or in the therapeutic relationship. Thus, eventually, this confirmed her unconscious belief that attachment figure is not available to protect her from traumatic experience. So I think contextualizing client's problem in terms of attachment relationships is quite important to understand this case. Because um, usually we focus on the symptoms. Uh, in this case, she was workaholic. Uh, so the symptoms are coming foreground. And also the uh, DSM or ICD, uh, those uh, diagnostic manuals focusing on the symptoms only. However, we need to understand background as, uh, as well. That is, background is context of attachment relationships. And I think DMM assessment like DMM AI can clarify the background, which was at first behind the symptoms. Because as she often said, uh, sorry, so the whole figure is an, I think, function. Like um, uh, she often said she working hard because um, uh, if she works hard and hard, she can overcome the past experience. So that means Overwork or being a workaholic have a function to protect herself from her past traumatic experience. So I think that this famous uh, figure is useful to understand the relationship between the symptoms and the context and the function. And uh, I, I want to talk about the future of the DMM in Japan. I think um, DMM can be used as a meta theory for integrating different schools of psychotherapy. Cretendence says 
existing treatments can be interpreted in terms of a focus on memory systems and representations, uh, representational models. So this is um, DMM's memory systems and representational models. In this paper, she said, um, behavioral therapy mainly focus on the procedural uh, memories while cognitive therapy focus on semantic generalizations and uh, psychoanalysis focus on episodes and uh, maybe we can add other new approaches like interpersonal psychotherapy focus on the pro procedural memories as well and the family therapy or relational psychoanalysis is, I think, always also focusing on procedural memories. And also art therapy mainly focuses on images. And the schema therapy maybe also focus on episodes and also procedural memories as well. And um, mentalization approaches uh, focus on reflective integration and uh, some somatic psychotherapy for trauma focus on organic states. So I think I think to consider the relationship among different approaches based on different values, DMM is quite useful in my understanding. Because in Japan, every year, many, many different psychotherapy approaches or schools are translated into Japanese. And the Japanese are quite busy with, you know, uh, studying the new approaches. But I think we need kind of, you know, uh, kind of something to integrate those different, sometimes contradictory ideas. I think DM, DMM is the best to help us to integrate those various approaches. I have questions, but I would like it to open it up to the floor. Um, Shahid, I don't want to um, put you under the spotlight, but you've just mentioned a May, and I think that's something I wanted to ask about as well. So would you like to come on and ask that question? Morning. I was just interested in, in, I mean, it seems as you were going through your presentation that those concepts feel, fit in very well with the DMM or my understanding of the DMM, um, particularly in terms of dependency needs and pulling people in to um, perhaps address those um, dependency or attachment needs. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about those concepts. I, I know they weren't mentioned in the, presentations but um i was thinking about them throughout the uh, presentation so that's uh, i don't know how you pronounce them am i and am i root am i yes um yes um okay just i think uh to put it simply am i is uh, emotion uh to take advantage of other people's kindness. Like, um, you know, uh, the it was the concept found by Takeo Doi, a psychoanalyst in Japan. And uh, you might have read it, but the famous episode uh, in that he found Amaya is uh, when he first time went to US, he, um, arrived at host family's house and he was asked if he, if he wants a, um, ice cream. Although he was hungry at that time, he said, oh, no, thank you. And the host family said, okay, and never gave him an ice cream and he was quite disappointed. So I think this is typical Japanese way of accepting, you know, first, 
we say, oh no, 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 thank you. That's that's okay. But if you suggest the second time, okay, thank you very much. So I think, um, but in the Western countries, you have to express your wishes directly, more directly probably. And, uh, but while the other in Japanese culture, we expect other people would say the same thing again. So uh, this, uh, this is what I mean by taking advantage of other people's kindness. And uh, Doi said, um, uh, Michael Barinto said, um, uh, he cited his sentence and uh, all the European languages fail to distinguish between active love and passive love. And the Doi said, Ama is in fact none other than, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, passive love is uh, uh, Amae itself. So I think this distinction is quite useful to understand the essence of Amae. And uh, also, um, he believes the amai is a kind of keyword to understand Japanese culture or society because amai is in a quite dependent, dependent, dependent culture, like not, not rather than individual culture. Uh, amai is quite easily accepted in our interpersonal relationships. But he also insisted that in Western countries, also it's quite, it's not easy to express a my feeling in the Western countries. It does exist, but it could be often uh, dismissed or not found. That's what she said. Is that okay? That's that's very interesting. I mean, it, it is a. It, I don't think we have a word for it in uh, Indian and Pakistani culture, but it's a very similar um, way of interacting. And oh, okay. um, I, I liked your descriptions of um, passive love. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I can certainly recognise that within our cultures as well. Okay, that's interesting because um. Uh, in another famous episode is that when Doi was um, meeting a uh, foreign client who is who was an English speaker, said um, she, at first they were talking their problems in English, and uh, it was about her child, and uh, she suddenly suddenly started speaking Japanese. She said, oh, this child didn't amaeru. And uh, Doi wondered why you use Japanese at that sentence. And she said, maybe we don't have uh, amaeru in the corresponding word for amaeru in English. So that's the times Doi believed or she found the key concept for understanding Japanese. So I think uh, because if you have the similar corresponding word for a mile, the, I think the, it should be uh, quite um, uh, important words to understand your culture or society, I guess. Well, you have to ask anyone if they want a drink uh, 10 times to be polite. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Shi. That's a really interesting question. Um, does anybody else have a question for Ken? Ken, I, I have heard you refer a number of times in today's presentation to Japanese culture. And of course, um, we make these generalizations, don't we? But I'm, I'm wondering what your ideas are about the differences you have seen in different parts of Japanese culture, for example, older generation, younger generation, city, country, um, Ainu versus mainstream Japanese culture? Oh, that's an interesting question. Thank you. 
um <clears throat> actually uh the culture we have different cultures in japan for example the west part of japan and the east part of japan is quite different you know uh sometimes uh, especially osaka is the biggest city the second biggest city after tokyo and uh, the people from osaka uh, we are you know we are in independent country or something like that and their way of speaking is quite different and uh, also uh, the southern island which is called okinawa was surrounded by a very beautiful sea it has a uh, very different culture actually their race is uh, quite similar or almost same as Ainu who lived in Hok lives in Hokkaido in the northern part of Japan but the, the Okinawa culture is quite uh, near to uh, Taiwan or you know quite influenced by Chinese culture and uh, for example you know uh, we call it uh, Okinawa time because they always come late <laughs> you know Japanese are famous as punctual you know the when I was studying in UK just once we had a Japanese drinking party it's just just one time only Japanese came together and all the people come before the you know time you know they are just puncture and we said oh we are japanese something like that but when you know meeting okinawa people they are like um kind of italian or something like that <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is a um, uh, correct thing to say but i mean they are quite um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, free and, uh, you know, flexible at the time. So, you know, so I think it's a good question. We do have some uh, uh, many uh, different cultures in our country. Thank you, thank you, Ken. I, I loved the presentation, and thank I, you, I think you. I think that your your final slide, showing the information processing model and the different therapies and where they might be particularly beneficial, I think it's the most powerful visual summary I've seen of how the DMM can can uh, be integrative of many different types of therapies. So thank you for that. I'm I'm going to borrow from that. Thank you, Ken. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Clark. Um, Ken, I have a question. Um, you talked about attacku, and you talked about yeah. suicide, and you and I have talked a little bit about hikikomori before as well. And I just wondered, do you see these um, sort of behaviours as sort of functionally equivalent? Are they an attempt? Are they an attempt to achieve something in different ways? And do you have anything to say about that? Mm. It's a difficult question. I, I mean, they, they must have a function to, you know, to adapt themselves to the Japanese society or protect themselves from the pressure from the society. Um, but I'm not really sure they are seen or not. Um, I think um, because Clark uh, just mentioned the kind of generational gap mm -hmm. and uh, because in the past when you know, people can believe that if you go to the good university, you can go to get a good job and have a happy life. 
it was okay. But now most young Japanese do not believe that kind of grand narrative anymore. Mm -hmm. So in postmodern society like Japan, because you know our economy is going down and down. I'm, I I know it, but as a society, we are still kind of uh, safe and rich at this moment. So people have many things and, uh, you know, but people do not have a kind of, you know, absolute uh, narrative or answer about how to live. So there are many, many small narratives and otaku and hikikomori might have a function to continue living under such uh, conditions uh -huh. without grand narrative. What do you think? I think that's really, really interesting. Um, I think when I visited Japan, I was struck by the um, by the how the old and the new in all of the cities I visited seemed to stand alongside each other. Um, and it, it was both fascinating and beautiful, but also I suppose speaks to something about a real change and a real dissonance between different aspects of Japanese um, tradition and, and modernity as well. And I, I imagine that plays out for young people in making sense of what they're trying to achieve. I think what you said as well about um, them being some, these behaviours being protective is really important too. And not seeing them as uh, as sort of problems, as rather than see, rather seeing them as solutions to the challenges that young people are perhaps facing. I could go and talk about that for ages with you, but I appreciate we don't have that much longer. And I do want to ask you about the translation of the adult attachment interview book because I think this is a really important part of your your work. Um, so. Could you just give me a bit of context as to why you chose to take that on? Um, yes, um, I think um, I attended the attachment and psychopathology course in 2012. And then next year, 2013, I started training for the DMM AI. Uh, actually, Clark was one of the facilitators and uh, I thought, um, because um, firstly, there are many books who introduced the DM, uh, introduced the AI in Japan, but um, nevertheless, most people didn't know how to interpret the results of the AI. And also, it was all about ABC plus D. Mm -hmm. Nobody talked about the DMM AI at that time. So I think translating the yellow book is a good way to introduce to Japan both the idea of DMM as well as the uh, procedure of administering the AI. So that's why I thought I should translate this book. And did you have um, experience translating before taking on the challenge? Yes, um, just some chapters like uh, uh, as I said, uh, Daniel Stan's Motherhood mm -hmm. Constellation and also the Peter Fonagy's uh, de uh, de uh, Developmental Psychopathology in Psychoanalysis or something like that. I, yeah. I translated some chapters, but not the whole book. Mm -hmm. So you had some preparation. 
what were there concepts and ideas within um, the DMM within the Yellow Book that didn't have uh, a, a direct translation into Japanese? You've talked about how some Japanese terms don't have direct translations in English. Was it the same for you trying to find the correct way of conceptualizing things in Japanese? Mm. Um, I can't. I, I can't think of particular words, but I mean, I, I'm not sure if that's because uh, I was not familiar with the DMM concepts, or there are much linguistic difference between English and Japanese. Anyway, the everything was new to me. So every time I found difficult to interpret the words or the sentences, I sent an email to uh, Patwa Andrea uh -huh. to ask what this means or what should I do, something like that. And uh -huh. I repeated it many, many times. Yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. And so they were both quite engaged in the process. Yes. With uh huh, that's good. Uh, and was there anything that you found uh, beyond some of that translation? Was there anything you found particularly difficult in the in the process? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> sorry. I mean, all the process was difficult. So <laughs> I mean, uh, I actually I have I had many colleagues to translate together, but I had a responsibility to you know. Uh, make the book coherent, mm -hmm. especially in terms of the, uh, you know, words or concepts. So, you know, I have to read, read each translator's chapter and then checking their uh, words and, uh, you know, trying to find if that the same words is a uh, translated into the same translation you know uh -huh. so and uh, you know sometimes the same english word need to be translated into different japanese uh -huh. according to the context so, you know if i apply the same translation into many contexts it it looks quite funny or sometimes too rigid you know or too mechanistic so it's you know even the same word can be same english word can be translated into different japanese words according to the context so okay. i think that that is a very difficult point for me. And if you read and trying to translate 400 pages or something, you will be confused anyway. So, yes. It's a, it's a massive undertaking. How long did it take you? It's, it's five years. Five years. Yes. That's, that's incredible. And do you feel that your understanding of the DMM improved through that process? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the uptake been like in Japan? Have, have you found it's that it's have you found that people have been reading the book and starting to incorporate some of those DMM ideas into their work? Uh, I think um, I it was picked up for the book review in mm -hmm. the Japanese Journal of Psychoanalysis, okay. and the reviewer said. Because he he was one of the person who tried to introduce mentalizing approach into Japan, and he said reading uh, this book <laughs> helped him to understand more about mentalizing. I found it quite interesting. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. Could you could you hold it up again? Because we may have yeah. some Japanese viewers, and they may want to purchase it. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope. That is wonderful. 
And yeah. I hope that sits on Dr. Crittenden's bookshelf as well. That's a remarkable oh, part really? of, the, oh. of the DMM canon, for sure. Okay, that is wonderful. I, again, I have lots more I can ask, but I, I'm conscious of time. And I would like to open up again to questions if other people would like to ask. Yeah. yeah, Ken, I remember having some conversations with you about translation and interpretation of memory systems. And it was making distinctions between an imaged memory discourse marker versus semantic memory. And I was wondering if you came if you came across this when you were doing your either you're learning about the AAI or your, your uh, translation. For example, a phrase we might use is, that person is a pain in the neck. And if you took it literally, you might think, oh, that's imaged memory. But in English usage, it's a semantic summary of a person's experience of the other person. And I was wondering if in, in Japanese, that distinction exists in the in the in the way that i'm describing mm. i'm i'm not really sure <laughs> because um you know um i as a linguistic difference i found it more difficult to understand it when i had an i had reading i had read a protocol of the AI interview during my training, rather than translating the textbook yellow book, because um, in the yellow book, the uh, interview itself is not uh, so written. It's not, Pat said she intentionally didn't write a lot of you know cite a lot of um, uh, actual interview, so. But uh, during the training, because I'm not familiar with uh, colloquial words, expression. So, um, for example, when Pat said, oh, this word is quite uh, evocative words. I, I didn't know, oh, is this evocative? No, I, I can I can read my dictionary to understand meaning, but I cannot judge whether this is evocative or not. Yes. So that's a linguistic problem when I face during the training rather than translating. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. I saw that Bronwyn had a question, so I'll... Okay, thank you, Clark. Thanks, Ken. So Bronwyn. Yeah, I've un unmuted. Hi, Ken. It was Hi, um, great to hear. Great to hear most of your presentation. I'll have to go yes. back later and listen to the beginning. I couldn't get away in time. Thank you very um, much. My, my question's probably a bit similar to Clark's in that I was wondering whether because um, you were trained initially in English, when you're looking at a Japanese transcript, do you find yourself translating any of it into English in your mind or you're, are you able to to use the discourse markers and stay in Japanese language. And related to that, do, do you think over time, if more people become familiar with the AAI in Japanese or in fact in any other language, we might identify discourse markers that are um, more specific culturally and linguistically mm -hmm. that we don't pick up, um, particularly um, in in English and kind of the related languages. That's that's very important questions. Thank you. I think uh, firstly, when I read the Japanese AI, I always used English code. Mm -hmm. So I I I translated coding into Japanese in the yellow book. But when mm -hmm. I coded, I always use English. <laughs> yeah. Also, I I understand I understand the Japanese sentence as a Japanese as Japanese. I don't translate it into English, but nevertheless, I use I prefer using English coding systems. Mm. It's easier for me, mm. and I also uh, I think um, you know I I might be able to find a kind of um, new markers 
in Japanese, which is not apparent in English coding system. But um, so far, because um, you know, we we do need to you know uh, collect more data of the AI in Japanese, and also we need more other Japanese AI coders to find the you know find them if if they are so. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Thank mm. you. Yeah, that might be the um, work of a lifetime yeah, yeah. Um, to, <laughs> to do enough AI to find the information. But that's interesting that the possibility is there. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. Okay, I think that probably brings us to the end, Ken. Um, that has been thoroughly fascinating. And thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your ideas. Um, so do, what, what, what's next for you? Will we expect to see more things written or communicated from you in the future? Yeah. Uh, um, because um, I, I had a training of the KI index with Bronwyn, mm -hmm. I, I hope we start training with other DMM assessments. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in this moment, I'm, I'm not sure, but I hope, um, you know, after Corona, or well, it's Corona anyway, I can go to go abroad to have more training and uh, to meet with you and other DMMs in the training or conference. That's what I hope now. That would be fantastic. Are there other DMMers in Japan or are you alone as the, the one who has the most training and uses it the most uh, in As work? for KI Index, many people now okay. join the course, but uh, for the AI, two or three. Okay, so it's a, a big burden to carry, to, sh yeah. to share the word, but it seems like you're doing an amazing job at that. Thank so you. thank you so much for everything you. that you've shared today. And we will leave it there.